First, a hearty thanks to everyone who completed the last homework assignment. Click the annotation for the last installment for details. Many thanks to user MTL Red Atheist for his answer. Humans and chimps, same components, different proportions. Now he is an uploader, so go check him out after this video. Today's look at homeopathy centers around an article in the Huffington Post written by this man, Dana Ullman. He is one of, if not the foremost, experts in homeopathy and therefore ranks among the titans of the BS pantheon. We'll be looking at a number of statements from the article, which is linked you know where, after a short intro to homeopathy itself. It's hard to imagine anything less intelligible than homeopathy, as it stands in direct contravention to well-established principles in the fields of chemistry, physics, information theory, logic, and any real scientific endeavor. It also defies common sense. Note the asterisk by no observable impact. We'll come back to that soon. Imagine you have a cup of water and some salt. If you dissolve enough salt in the water, you'll notice that, and prepare to be stunned, the water will taste salty. If we increase the salt for a fixed quantity of water, the solution becomes saltier. Or if we decrease the amount of water for a fixed quantity of salt, same result. Higher concentrations of salt, whether by addition or subtraction, will always result. That's what observed chemistry and common sense tells us. Homeopathy tells us that if you take your water, add a chemical to it, parcel this out into test tubes, shake, and then dilute the solution into ever smaller amounts, that you can actually increase the potency of a chemical. I kid you not. This is all there is to it. But there is one legitimate medical condition that homeopathic water can treat and cure with exactly the same efficacy as modern, science-based medical practice. Don't omp don't. Now let's look at that asterisk by the observed impact. If you're a fan of psychology, then you've no doubt heard of the placebo effect. This is a psychosomatic reaction to virtually any treatment that the recipient believes will help them. Even if there's no physiological or chemical reaction to justify it, the power of the human mind is such that it can essentially be tricked into believing that a non-treatment will succeed. However, the placebo effect, while being real and documented so much that to establish the efficacy of a drug or treatment, said drug must demonstrate not only effectiveness, but effectiveness beyond the placebo effect. It cannot regrow limbs, magically dispel cancer, or anything so drastic. Keep this in mind as we read the article. Now, I wanted to point by point the whole thing, but eviscerating a steaming dung pile of this density and magnitude would take forever, so I'm just hitting a few points. However, I invite everyone to read the original, and if there are any philosophy professors that happen across this video, feel free to use the article as a final exam game of find the logical fallacies and errors in judgment. There are plenty. The article opens with an apples to oranges false equivalency of a chemical explosive to a nuclear bomb blast. Consider a bomb that uses 1,000 pounds of chemical explosive. That's lots of chemicals for a half-ton blast. A nuclear bomb only needs a few kilograms of fissile material to produce a blast many thousands or million times more powerful. However, a more apt comparison for Mr. Ullman's statement would set a 1,000-pound bomb next to a single grain of black powder. Ah, yes, the oh-so-scientific practice of shaking vigorously. I checked my wife's old pharmacology textbook, and surprisingly, there's not a single mention of vigorous shaking anywhere to be found. I also checked online in the peer-reviewed literature and found nothing. Curious? Well, to be fair, there's never just water. Even in just water, there are always trace amounts of stuff floating around. However, calling the skeptics of an unscientific endeavor arrogant or closed-minded is a common tactic. It deflects responsibility from actually trying to justify how diluting a chemical will increase its effectiveness within the body. Let's take a moment and reflect on this. Setting the issue of souls aside for now, your body is made of chemicals. Everything on Earth is made of chemicals. Chemicals are, of course, comprised of atoms and molecules, and these particles only react to other particles. Ask yourself, if there are no chemicals present in homeopathic water besides the water itself and maybe a single molecule of the treatment, how is this medicine supposed to react with your body at all. Point four. Well, if one guy has verified it, then it must be true, right? Right? No, 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 no. Science does not work in isolated pockets detached from the rest of society. Genuine endeavors revolve around research, universities, labs, and communities. One source does not equal some or any authority. If you're a sharp little cook, you no doubt notice this not-so-subtle appeal to authority. Here's a tricky bit of skullduggery. Some compounds are more powerful than others. The user Concordance made an excellent video called The Dose Makes the Poison, and it more than illustrates the point. However, the kind of doses homeopaths are using are so dilute and so sparse that it's likely you're getting a dose with none of the original component. Nanopharmacology strikes me as the same sort of relabeling that creationism got when it changed to intelligent design. I call your attention to the last phrase, which makes me chuckle, since there are no properly executed studies that show anything more than placebo effect for any homeopathic treatment without physiological doses. 
How it works is no mystery. The lightest touch of Occam's razor reveals that this is mere placebo effect in action, and to study further would be a waste of time. The distinction between small doses of potent chemicals and zero doses of anything is important, and will be muddled by the expert homeopath in the next few points. Detection of pheromones. Mr. Ullman also used the example of sharks detecting blood in the water, and this is true enough. However, other instruments can also detect pheromones in disparate chemical concentrations if they are sensitive enough. Putting homeopathic water into a mass spectrometer will reveal water and the usual trace stuff, nothing else. And if it doesn't show up in a detector of chemicals, whether in a lab or a receptor on a sense organ, there is no possible chemical or informational benefit to be found. None. And now we come to a fun bit. Homeopaths believe in water having memory. Yes, the disconnected jumble of molecules bouncing around each other with brownie and abandon can remember what chemicals they've interacted with. And it's funny that an article entitled How Homeopathic Medicines Work, Nanopharmacology at Its Best, would be so replete with mysterious mechanisms that are not at all understood. But hey, that won't stop anyone from speculating. You can pause the video here to read this bit about silica chips flaking off during the shaking process if you want. Ah yes, sweet, sweet, speculative nonsense. After all, silica chips are made of the same stuff as silicon monocrystals, and that's what computer chips are made out of. It all makes perfect sense. Of course, if this were a viable mechanism for aquatic information storage, then nature might provide something similar. So where would we ever find agitated water and particulate silicates in close proximity? How about on every single sandy beach on planet Earth? Sigh and tisk. I tire of this tedium. I think I'll let some of my favorite British comedians finish highlighting the absurdities of this practice. Thanks for watching, everyone. No homework this time. <laughs> what have we got? Yeah, broken arms, suspected internal injuries, severe contusions to the head. Okay, let's move fast. Premier solution of Arnica Montana. Stat. Strength? One part in a million. Are you sure? It looks serious. You're right. We need to strengthen the dose. One part in ten million. On it, Doctor. Well, you've got a tricky one. That's what we can't handle. Get me some wolfsbane, also known as monkshood in here. And a whole tray of flower remedies. Whoa, the chakras are fading. We need some crystals. Nurse, there should be some purple tinted quartz. You're right. Make that aquamarine quartz. Good call. Okay, he's stabilizing. Now, does anybody know what sort of car hit him? A blue form one day, apparently. Right, get me a bit of blue form one day. Put it in water, shake it, dilute it, shake it again, dilute it again, do some more shaking, dilute it some more, and then put three drops on his tongue. If that doesn't cure him, I don't know what will. You should have a look at this, Simon. What is it? I don't think this poor chap's got long to live. Why not? His lifeline. Very short. <laughs> but his horoscope's not too clever either. It's Sagittarius. Brace yourself for a surprise. Things are about to change for you. Certainly are, unless... Wait. What? We could try drawing a bit more lifeline on with Byro. It doesn't work. You got a better idea? Let's see what happens. <laughs> Time of death, 3.34. Ish. Day, eh? I just can't stand losing them. It happens. I don't know. Sometimes I think a trace solution of deadly nightshade or a statistically negligible quantity of arsenic just isn't enough. That's crazy talk, Simon. Okay, so you kill the odd patient with cancer or heart disease or bronchitis, flu, <laughs> chickenpox or measles. But when someone comes in with a vague sense of unease or a touch of the nerves or even just more money than sense, he'll be there for them bottle of basically just water in one hand and a huge invoice in the other. I suppose you're right. Now, another drink. I need one. Excuse me. Two more homeopathic lockers, please. <laughs> Whoa, that's strong stuff.